If you saw my video about the Roman Imperial cult, you heard me talk about how Julius Caesar and Augustus were deified and put up on the pedestal of glorious Messiah figures. And I don't say that exaggerating. I literally mean that these people were put up and thought of as great saviors to their country and the people that made Rome great again. There's two pieces of literature that came out during the reign of Augustus that are masterpieces. I mean, imagine if 2,000 years from now, people were talking about The Godfather and The White Album in the same sentence. This is what I'm doing right now. These two pieces of work are Ovid's Metamorphosis and Virgil's The Aeneid. Now, The Aeneid is a continuation from Homer and Hesiod's volumes of Greek mythology. What Virgil does here is he uses the same style of typology that Homer uses, also used by the Hebrews for the Old Testament where they take certain figures in time, certain events that happened, and they allegorize them. So for this, for this instance, the reign of Augustus is compared to the character of the Aenid, who's also in the book, The Odyssey. So right off the bat, Virgil is telling you that Aenid leaves the war at Troy, has his Odyssey, and then goes and finds the city of Latium, which is Rome, which is an allegory for Rome. He's telling you that, he's basically letting you know, wink wink, Aeneid is Augustus. So the entire book is just about the triumphs of Aeneid going to Carthage and winning the war there, just like Caesar did. Going to other places and defeating, their, his, defeating the enemies of Rome. And the character Aeneid is basically a composite of Julius Caesar and Augustus. That's where that's what it, the parallels are uncanny. They're just so obvious, and it's a great it's a great read too. It's great poetry. It's great symbolism. Great imagery. But a lot of critics of this work say that Virgil was just being super pessimistic and politically subversive to the Augustan regime. However, some people think that he was just um, celebrating the new imperial dynasty. So, depending on how you look at it, depending on your worldview, you'll see it differently. That was written in 29 BC. Fast forward to 9 AD, right towards the end of the reign of Augustus, where all these things have already happened, and they're looking back at all the glorious moments of the Augustan regime and his father, Julius Caesar, and Metamorphosis is being written by Ovid, and he's taking Greek mythology and he's Romanizing it. Certain gods, are, their names are being changed. Jupiter is, is was Zeus and now he's Jupiter. And you got Jove is another name for him. Dionysus is now Bacchus. You get the point. But the last chapter of Ovid Metamorphosis is what I'm going to talk about today. And that is the deification of Julius Caesar also known as the apotheosis of Julius Caesar. So it starts off with Asclepius. Now Asclepius, if you know if you saw my other video about Ophiuchus, the 13th constellation, this is the Romanized name for him. He's the god of medicine, he's the serpent bearer, He's the great physician. He is the archetype for the savior, the hero, the logos. And the last book of Metamorphosis was about him. And then it goes into the Julius Caesar deification. So here's how it starts off. Asclepius came from abroad to dwell in our shrines. But Caesar is God in his native city. He showed his genius in war and peace. But all his campaigns that ended in triumphs, all his achievements at home and his rapid promotion to glory, did less to secure his change to a consolation or comet than what was decreed by his son of the deeds of Julius Caesar, 
None can be greater than standing father to Caesar Augustus. Julius surely could boast that he conquered the island of Britons. He led a victorious fleet up the Nile with its seven mouth delta and banks so rich in papyrus he brought the Nubian rebels, Siphi and Juba, the realm of Pontus which swells with pride in the name Mithridates beneath the sway of the Roman people. He rode in triumphs and merited more, but how come in the glory of all these exploits amount the glory of having begotten a glorious son, a leader, with whom at the head of our empire. The gods have showed the riches of blessings on all mankind. Yet Julius' son could not have been born from a seed that was mortal, so Julius had to be made a god. When Aeneas' golden mother perceived this and also saw the tragic death awaited her priest at the hands of traitors sworn to his murder, her cheeks grew pale and she said to each of the gods she encountered, Look at the massive power of treachery marshaled against me. Look at the dangerous plot which threatens the life that I'd clearly cherish. The only surviving descendant of Trojan Ilius. Must I be the only god to be wracked by justified anguish? On day I receive a wound from the spear of the Greek Diomedes. Next I grieve for the walls of Troy so pearly defended that I must watch my son through the endless wanderings hounded tossed on the ocean, forced to enter the ghostly kingdom, fighting his wars with Turnus, or rather with Juno's hate, if truth be told. But why recite the trials of my family long in the past? My present alarm excludes my remembrance of earlier fears. Look there. You see them, sharpening their daggers? The traitors. Stop them, I beg you. Avert this iniquity. Vesta's fires must never be quenched by the brutal death of her high priest. Such were the anxious complaints that Venus unsuccessfully aired all over Olympus. The gods were certainly moved, although they couldn't de defy the iron decrees of fates. They still were able to give clear signs of looming disaster. Men say the crime was foreshadowed by clashing arms in the black clouds. Trumpets and horns were also be blaring and blaring in heaven, the sun's face also gloomy and steeped the uneasy earth. In ghostly pallor, the shooting stars were constantly streaking. Across the sky and the drops of blood were discharged in the rain clouds. The face of the morning star was dimmed and bespeckled with dirty, rust-colored spots. Blood spatters the chariot bearing the moon all over the city. The Stygian owl was hooting its sinister omens. Ivory statues wept, and voices chanting dirges of doom could be heard, they say, in the sacred groves. Every sacrificed victim presented signs of bad omen. The lobe of a liver had been cut off by the priest to be found in the entrails, and so give token of mighty upheavals impending. Out in the forum, around men's houses and close to temples, the night was disturbed by the howling of dogs. The street were haunted by a roaming ghost of the dead, and the city was shaken by tremors. But warmings from heaven were powerless to halt the plot of forestall. What fate had decreed, the conspirators entered the hall of the Senate, naked swords in their hands, no other building in Rome, but that sacred place would serve for their crime, for the infamous murder. That was the moment when Venus beat her breast with both of her hands and attempted to hide Aeneas' descent in the cloud. As once she had stolen Paris away from his foe, Menelaus, and helped Aeneas himself to escape Diomedes' sword, then Jupiter said to her, Daughter, must you be the only goddess to fight invincible fate? You may go yourself to the Hall of the Sisters Three, and there you will revisit the records of fortune. A massive structure of tablets inscribed in the brass and the soldiest iron. These tables fear no clashing of clouds, nor the thunderbolts of wrath, nor destruction. However it come, they are safe from abiding. There you will find your family's destines cast in enduring adamant. 
I myself have persuaded the notes of contents. Pay heed to the truth. You must not be left in the dark any longer. The man for whom you are laboring, Venus, has come to the end of his time. The years he has owed to the earth are duly completed. Now he will rise to the sky as a god and be worshipped in temples. You will ensure it. You with the son who was heir to his name and his shoulder, the lonely burden of state with us as allies in war. The bravest of men shall avenge the death of his father. He shall be lord of the day when beloved Bettina is captured and sues for peace. His might shall be felt for Ella's pain and is drenched with the blood the second time in the field of Philippi. Sextus Pompeius shall suffer defeat in Sicilian waters. A Roman general's Egyptian mistress who trusted the marriage, torch to her coast, shall fall and the threat be given the lie. The Rome's capital should bow our isle of Canopus. But should I list barbarian lands and nations that lie to the east and the west where men can live and be fed by the soil? And the land shall be his. The sea shall follow and know him as a master. When peace has come to earth, he will turn his mind to the duties and rights of the people at home. Most just as giver of laws, he will guide men's ways and be his example, his eye for future. For his descendants to come will lead him to order to holy. Livia's son to adopt his name with the cares of his office. Only when he has come to Pelion Nestor's years shall he rise to our home in the heavens and join the star of his kinsmen. Meanwhile, you rescue your father's soul from his cut-ridden body. You make him a comet. That deified Julius image may always gaze on my capital from the height of the shrine and forum. Scarcely had Jupiter ended the speech when life-giving Venus set herself down in the heart of the Senate, though no one can see her, and caught the soul of her Caesar up as it passed her body. She did not allow it, component atoms, to be dispersed into air, but carried it straight as it were to the stars in the heavens. During her journey, she felt the glowing with of catching fire, so she let it escape from her bosom and fly right upwards. Higher, far, the moon is soared, displaying a sweeping trail of flame in its woke, till it finally took the form of a gleaming star. Now Julius watches his son's achievements and proudly admits they surpass his own, though Augustus will never let it be said that his deeds are greater than those of his father. Speech what is free and unfettered in spite of the emperor's wishes, declares him supreme and ventures only in those who oppose him. Lastly, to take on the example that matches the case of our Caesars, Saturn is likewise lower than Jupiter. Jupiter governs the heavenly heights and the realms of the three formed universe. Earth is under Augustus, and each is his ruler and father. I call on you, gods, who attended at Aeneas through the fire and sword, and compelled them to yield native Italian gods and Quirinus, who founded our city on Mars, who fathered unconquered Quirinus, Vesta, and Caesar reveres among the gods of his household, Apollo, an honored neighbor to Caesar, as surely as Vesta, Jupiter, throned in the th temple surrounding the heights of Tarpeia, and all the other gods whom righteous poet may worship, slow down the day long after my name when Augustus leaves the world, that he rules and rises up to the heavens, so may he lend a favoring ear to our prayers from a new home. Then there's an epilogue right after that that says, Now I have finished my work, which nothing can ever destroy, not Jupiter's wrath, nor fire or sword, nor devouring time. That day, which has power over nothing except this body of mine, may come when it will end the uncertain span of my life. But now the finer part of myself shall sweep me into eternity hard in the stars. My name shall never be forgotten. Wherever the might of Rome extends in the lands he has conquered, the people shall read and recite my words throughout all ages. If poets have vision of prophecy and truth, I shall live in my fame. So he 
glorifies Augustus and Julius Caesar, makes them as gods. And then he writes a little epilogue, and that's the last thing he does. That's the last canon in Roman, myth- Roman mythology. It's like the final, re- like the book of Revelation in Christianity. It's the last thing that's ever written down. Is that is is about how G- Julius Caesar is equal to Apollo, and it's just so crazy how right after that Virgil predicts his future and says, "I am going to be remembered throughout all the ages as the greatest of all poets," and sure enough you can't really deny that that's true like 2000 years later i'm sitting here reading his poems on a youtube channel so who knows he'll probably be talked about for the next thousand years too but if you like that hit the like button and subscribe catch you later